If you're like me, you've got contacts in every single possible format. Email, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And it's becoming harder and harder to stay on top of them. To help me make sense of this mess, I use Smarter Contacts, the free app that automatically creates rich profiles for all my contacts right on my smartphone. The thing I love most about this app are the rich profiles it creates. I can see photos, job titles, company details, and updates from social networks all in one place, all in context. This is a free app and available on all mobile platforms. Head to www.ontether.tv forward slash smarter to download it today. Hello, everybody. Welcome to M-Pulse, episode number five. We're recording this live uh, on February 9th, 2012. My name is... Rob Woodbridge from Untethered.tv, and with me as always, Peggy Ann Saltz, Mobile Groove, based in Europe. Yes, that's right. I should say that I'm based in Canada, for those who don't recognize my accident. A, <laughs> there we go. I just have to say A at the end of everything, and then people will recognize, well, he's, he's got to be Canadian, eh? <laughs> this is the, uh, the show, the vodcast you come to for a little bit of insight about what's going on, some analysis about what's going on in the mobile industry in North America and Europe and around the world. Plus a deep dive into a topic, and today we've got a great topic. We're, it's the first episode of our Voice uh, series, and uh, Bill Mizell from TMA and Associates. TMA Associates is here to talk about that, and we're going to get to that in, in a little while. We'll bring him on. It's a great interviewer uh, and uh, in-depth knowledge about it. He's actually running the Mobile Voice Conference in San Francisco on March 12th to 14th. If you can get there, get there. Uh, but before we do. We always dive into, we take some of the topics that have been percolating in the industry, some stats, we jam them all together in this opening segment where we, we kind of give you a little bit of an analysis, our own opinions, if you will, about what's going on inside of this space. Does that sound about right, Peggy? Yep, yep, that's what we do. We bring in insights from around the world, around the space, and also some things from not quite the beaten trough path. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> beaten <laughs> And, and that's exactly what it is. It, um, you know, I think this time, my my topic is is completely mainstream because it's very topical uh, about what happened uh, last weekend, which was the uh, I don't know the television event of of the of the year called the Super Bowl. We're talking about um, that Super Bowl. 110 million people watched the the Super Bowl. It's a massive media event. It's built up. The game was actually very good. Um, I know, Peggy, I don't think you stayed up to watch it or got up early to watch it. No, I, I did that last time around when the Pittsburgh Steelers yeah. played because I'm from Pittsburgh originally. But this time I said, no, nope, it's all right. It's not the home game, so I'll sit this one out. Well, but, uh, it was a great game. <laughs> it was a great game, but most people t tune in for the ads. I, I would say that you know that, that a lot of that audience is the, the buzz for some reason that is generated as a result of the ads that go in the Super Bowl. You're paying $3.5 million for a 30-second spot. And uh, I, I wrote uh, an article for Untethered.tv recently, which is a, a lament against that. And it's not just spend your three and a half million. I don't care. That's your that's your money. But it was the complete lack of real mobile engagement that drove me up the wall. I'm going to throw some stats at you as we go into this. But uh, I, I believe that the, the advertisers wasted one of the biggest opportunities to reach and engage with an audience that they've ever had 110 million that's a record for watching the super bowl and what did they do zero <clears throat> now you will hear statistics you will hear people throw out statistics about the number of twitter posts that were done through a mobile device which was astounding like 10 or 12 thousand a minute were going out um it sets all these kind of records but i don't know what that means except for maybe a little bit of engagement so you'll, you'll also hear about statistics like 40% of people were engaged in mobile searches during the show, during the, uh, during the Super Bowl. Um, but that's not, that's not really mobile marketing or mobile engagement. That's just people too lazy to get off the couch to actually get to the computer and search. It's, a, it's an old paradigm. Then you'll hear about, uh, you know, the, uh, the statistic. This is a great one, actually, where the 40% um, uh, or there was more upload activity than download activity. On a mobile device in the Super Bowl, it's well, of course. I mean, photos mm -hmm. taken, video taken, but but one of the one of the things that drove me crazy is that these ads, these ads that are have our captivation. We are stuck in front of the TV because that's what we want. Didn't do anything to push mobile, to push engagement. 
They are still old school broadcast, one way dialogue. Let's hire, you know, uh, Jerry Seinfeld or uh, uh, who else was who else was there? Um, all these celebrities like Clint Eastwood, and uh, and throw in an ad and put in a huge production, and then what? It stops in the living room. A broadcast mechanism. These advertisements are dead, and it's soon people have got to realize this. That boy, oh boy, there has to be two way engagement. Although there was one great statistic, and I'll, I have to read this because it was a uh, a Google stat that said that uh, you know of of a lot of people that searched in here, uh, this is about mobile engagement. And uh, so Clint Eastwood did this Chrysler spot, what they call, called a, a moving Chrysler spot, um, called Halftime in America. And uh, if this is validation that they don't get mobile, uh, I don't know what else is. Mm-hmm. Uh, they said Google went out and publicized this. In fact, where they said. Uh, um, during that spot, Clint Eastwood searches on Google went up 5,500%. And I think they missed the point here that this is a Chrysler ad, not a Clint Eastwood ad, right? So what are, what are they saying when, when, it's, when that happens is that they didn't take mobile seriously. There it wasn't any two-way engagement. So mobile for me was a complete failure except for one little company that tried, tried hard. This company has 175 million users worldwide. It's called Shazam. We've talked about these guys. But I'll tell you what. they Half of the ads that were on the Super Bowl were Shazamable. And they engaged, at least they tried to engage, with the viewer by doing some insane giveaways from Best Buy. They were giving away cars from other from uh, car companies. and But they tried. And I think that that's the important thing is that they tried, but it always seemed like an afterthought, like a competition. They, were, they had to do a giveaway. There was no engagement. And uh, one of the things that I talk about in the article very quickly is the fact that there's going to be a secondary ad network that's going to disrupt the primary networks and the ads that they that uh, that are displayed. And Shazam showed us a glimpse of this, where you Shazammed any time during the Super Bowl game, you would get statistics and additional content, additional sponsors. They're doing it at the Grammys this coming weekend, and th- this is what I'm. This is where disruption happens: is that when an ad is no longer as relevant, especially when a company like Shazam is 175 million. Kind of a rant, but I don't believe that we are anywhere nearer to true mobile engagement and that bridging that divide between the gap between our couch and our television set, if this is an example of it, it was a complete failure for me this year. We'll see what happens next year. Peggy? I'm not going to rant too much because I'm sort of the optimist. Maybe it's my female side here, but what I do read out of this is, you know, in businesses, CMOs, that level of business, they need a confirmation that they need to take mobile seriously. So this is a good confirmation. This says to them and all the naysayers out there, yes, mobile needs to sit at the center of your campaign. People are multitasking. They are watching TV. They're doing something else. Now, if you can just get that handover right, if you can say, here's the app, and when the app leaves off, here's where the website starts. Here's the website. It works in conjunction with what's going on on TV or what's going on in my tablet or what's even going on in the radio brings Shazam back into it with audio I think that that's the good news of course the bad news is we haven't executed on it but the good news is that we won't go to any more of those conferences in 2012 talking about mobile as a personal device or will this be the year of mobile I mean it's here it's here already Super Bowl proves it and I hope that all of the you know the boardrooms that that's straight and that's clear and now we can execute on it. So that's good news for me. I agree with you, however, on execution, bad marks, no question about it. And also, if we're talking about engagement, and it is personal, then where is some of that engagement? And that comes back to the whole idea of understanding that it's not broadcast, it's two-way, mobile is two-way, it starts in a text message where it's two-way, you send me a text and I maybe opt in and send you something back, yeah, and it's the same thing here. So you need to work that into the architecture of the advertising. It's about leaving that gap open for people who want to, not the lurkers. I know 90% of us are lurkers, we don't do anything. I know that I see that on my site. Everybody, Everybody talks about it, and you know nobody's commenting so something's out there but the lurkers forget them leave a door open for the people who want to participate and you'll have most of it covered 
Totally agree. It's not about eyeballs anymore. It's about active engagement. Right? Mm-hmm. And so 110 million users, so many tweets. What did that what did that generate? Somebody give me something that it showed that there was value in this. When you throw uh, that much money around and you have that kind of an audience, I'd rather have, you know, 100 people that I've converted if I'm a car company like Chrysler. But instead, Clint Eastwood's stock went up. Mm-hmm. Right? So I, I agree that, that one of the things that, that, uh, that it did prove is, listen, you have to start listening to this. But what I'm hoping is that today, the day they start thinking about the ads for next year, is that there is a mobile component from the get-go. Not just a slap-on Shazam logo at the end mm-hmm. of it. Think about mobile. Think about mobile and everything that you do from the get-go. Start at mobile and then work out from there. It's also going to be very interesting to see the effectiveness because, you know, we have this optimistic moment where we have the attention of people in sea level positions saying, yes, mobile's there. Get your head around it. Put it in the center of the campaign. It's a channel that you cannot leave out, period, end, full stop. Now, if we have Shazam come in and be this add-on, and then, you know, again, speaking and thinking of Pittsburgh, I was there for Super Bowls in Pittsburgh. I know that nothing would have picked up sound in the saloon that I was at, was at the saloon in uh, the west end of Pittsburgh. You know, that's not usable there. And most times you're at an event, the sound quality is such that this isn't going to work. Now, I hope that we have some insight into how effective it was and doesn't... um, negate all of the pro side of it which is trying to engage that's a start maybe because the Super Bowl maybe because the noise level or the parties it didn't work we'll see what happens at the Grammys yeah they're talking about uh, millions of Shazams so I think that um, what that is I think we're gonna start to see this data come through and uh, and I'm, I'm eager to see it as well but uh, but again you know, Super Bowl, such an audience. Grammy, such an audience. The big picture here for me is that uh, if, the, if the big networks and the big ad providers don't get on board, the secondary ad market is going to take off where it actually becomes affordable to advertise. In, to get in front of Shazam, say, Shazam's 175 million people, that audience. That's a big network and growing every day. All right, I don't, want, I don't want to beat up the Super Bowl. It's a great game. I love the game. <clears throat> I just wish I had seen more mobile components, more engagement, Less broadcast, and uh, and hopefully we don't have this conversation a year from now. I I don't think we will, Rob. Good. I really don't. What I'm hearing out there in the industry, my connections and my conversation with with the C level, you know, CMO and his staff, sort so to speak, I am hearing a lot about understanding this, and more importantly, that it just can't be one event. Super right. Bowl's great, yeah. but it has to be ongoing. It has to go on long after that. So I will I will um, place a bet. That next year it'll be better. All right, I, I'll hold you to that. Okay. You I don't can. know what the bet is, but hopefully Pittsburgh's in it. That's that's the difference, right? Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> because, I miss you'd, that. Be, you'd be up in the morning. Can you All imagine right. a year when Pittsburgh isn't in it? It's amazing. <laughs> All right, so um, that was my rant. What was what was okay. it that you, what what did you pick up this week that was uh, that was maybe a, a little bit more positive than the way that I've spun this? But uh, what was yours, Peg? Well, I always look, you know, where where others aren't looking. That's what I, I do for a living. That's research. That's analysis. That's answering all the why questions and digging around. And um, this week I was at M Days, which is an excellent show in Frankfurt, I have to say. I think in total um, in and around 4,000 people over two days, which makes it, you know, next to Mobile World Congress, like the place you need to be in Europe because where else are you going to see that many people at once? And being located in Germany, also a market that is many times, not just in my opinion, but also quoted many times as the sleeping giant of mobile marketing. So, you know, a lot of uh, potential there, a lot of um, reason to catch up and get something moving, and a lot of revenues, you know, a lot of money to spend on it. The Germans don't have a problem there. So, um, went off to M Days in Frankfurt and uh, met with a number of companies and I also rediscovered I knew about Madvertise before it's a German ad network it's um founded in 2008 has offices in Germany, UK, Spain and um uh they have a quarterly report okay a lot of people do but I like to keep track of the quarterly reports because particularly if they're European focused where else are you going to get the data where else are you going to get the data points and the stats that you need so um they count roughly um, 
here we have 1.4 billion page impressions and looking at this then they have a quarterly report what are they seeing what devices what's the what are the attitudes working together with an app search engine search company rather um, also finding out you know what are the popular categories of apps what are the popular categories of apps on an iPhone versus an iPad so you've got lots of data I won't go through all of it that's what my analysis post over at Mobile Groove is for going into all the data but what I did find interesting I think you'll find this interesting Rob because you're over there in Canada and we we know how you feel about Blackberry um, was uh, a confirmation of the importance of Blackberry at least in Europe and uh, that's the number of page impressions on the BlackBerry devices b via Madvertise, which comes incidentally on the heels of some information and some news from Gizmodo that actually BlackBerry doesn't have such a bad market share in Europe after all. I mean, we'll see what 2012 brings, but 20, 2011 was, saw you know, a steep increase <laughs> to almost accounting for around um, a quarter. Um, I'll, I'll quote it actually for a moment. Um, this is BlackBerry sales. Uh, for December, and it was 26.3% uh, of the UK smartphone market during December 2011. And so they came out with a 27.7% share uh, for the month. Of course, that was December and that was 2011. We'll see what happens in 2012. But we do have a confirmation from Advertise that likewise, um, based on page impressions, BlackBerry also held a leading position. That went up from 1% at the beginning of 2012. 11 to around 23 percent. So as I said, won't go through all the stats, we don't have time for that. Interesting report, do download, it's madvertise.com and you'll give the details on your site, I'll give them over on mine. But what I think is also very interesting is it tells me as a takeaway point, if you're a marketer, if you're a brand out there and you're thinking about Europe and you're thinking about apps, you're thinking about what you're doing, Blackberry is one you cannot write off. So Yay Canada! You, Yay Canada, yes! <laughs> <laughs> I, I talk about this quite a bit is that uh, when people ask, uh, you know, where should they be developing for? What should they be developing for? You know, we've seen a, a, a considerable slide in BlackBerry uh, activity in, in North America. Um, and, and I mean, it's very competitive. It's hyper competitive. But they have published these numbers that in Europe and rest of the world, they are doing exceptionally well. They are uh, they're going gangbusters. I think the, the Nokia disappearance has enabled RIM to kind of pick up the slack on the low hand, low end uh, uh, smartphones uh, in in rest of the world, and it was one of their big strategies. North America is another thing. When a company announces that they're going to dump 4,400 Blackberries, I mean, there's 75 million Blackberries in use today. Um, I don't know why a company. I can't remember who did it. Um, and I'll look it up, but uh, one of the, one Fortune 500 company came out and said, we're going to dump all 4,400 Blackberries and go with iPhones. I don't know why they would ever release that data. That just, that's vindictive. And it's only mm. 4,400 out of 75 million. People would say that's just the, the, the tip of the iceberg. But Europe and Asia have been good to RIM. Very good. They have, you should be developing for that platform. I think the lesson is you have to be a cross-platform, and RIM is still a platform, whether you like it or not. Right? Absolutely. I love that. So we'll have the link uh, somewhere up there, depending on what site you're on. Somewhere up there. If you're not, go to uh, mobilegroove.com or on tether.tv and you'll find it there as well. Well, those, uh, you know, uh, we hope that there's insight here is that uh, we look a little bit behind the scenes to try to figure out if there's anything of value that you should know um, behind the numbers. Don't believe what you read. Don't believe what you see. Come here for the truth. Right, Peggy? Isn't that what we <laughs> Come right here for the truth. Well, well, come here for the for you know what isn't in the top ten everywhere else. I mean, that's what I see is the yeah. value here is you know we're going in depth to topics. We have a month dedicated to voice. I don't see anyone else doing that, but I do see an awful lot of posts. I saw one today about how important voice is. Well, yeah, we're looking into that. We're asking some tough questions. We're having some awesome guests on, and we're going to look at that. And the same thing is, you know, what's top of mind with both of us? We're both inserted into the industry. Yeah. We see a lot. We hear a lot. We interview a lot of people. We're bringing that in. I think that's great. It's the inside track. There's another one for you. <laughs> exactly. And you can only find it here. Impulse. All right. So um, one of the great things about doing this is, is that, you know, as you know, when you reach out to people and you ask them to be on the show, n not many people say no. Right? Because it's it's a way to get their platform out and their message out. And, and we believe that voice, 
Um, well, Mary Meeker called it what? What did she she call voice? The year of voice. The year of the ear. The year right. of the ear. Yes. And we believe that thought. definitely. And sometimes, you know, it takes a company like Apple to wake up an industry with Siri. Uh, but, you know, certainly they are not the first. They are not the only company to engage in this whole voice uh, piece. Uh, you know, there are a number of companies that are out there. And, and w so we, we sat down uh, with, uh, with Bill Mizell, who is from TMA Associates, who is, you, you quickly understand how much he knows about this industry and his depth and the fact that he's been in it for so long. He is an expert in voice and not just on the mobile space, but he's grown up with this in his businesses and what he's been doing. And it's fascinating, fascinating. Listen, some key points in here. So we're, we're going to jump, unless you have anything else that you want to talk to, say about Bill? No, I just call him, for me, he's the voice of voice. But the voice oh, of that's voice. I, <laughs> I should have just said that. <laughs> <laughs> so here he is, Bill Mizell, the voice of voice. Well, we are back, and with our first guest, to, when we're talking about uh, our first guest when it comes to voice, and spe specifically the impact that voice is going to have on mobile, we all know what seems to be going on right now, this voice revolution, I think brought on by Apple and by Siri, uh, but it's been going on for quite some time. I remember way back in the day, maybe the late 80s, trying to dictate into a computer and uh, being completely frustrated and thinking that, oh, if we only got this right, here we are 20 years later, and I think we're starting to get this right, and joining us to talk about this topic uh, is Biz Bill Mizell, who is actually um, from TMA Associates. Bill, thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing your knowledge. We really appreciate you being here. My pleasure. Why don't we start by talking about exactly uh, where do you come from? You know, this is an industry that's been, that is not new, um, and uh, you've been doing this for quite some time. Talk about yourself. What's your background? What are you doing now? Well, yeah, it's, it's hard. I don't know exactly how, uh, I don't have a very good elevator speech. Uh, I started out as a professor of uh, electrical engineering, computer science, and even wrote a book with a lot of equations in it on computer pattern recognition. So you can see that I was uh, uh, interested in this for a long time. In fact, uh, uh, I went to industry and managed the computer science division of an engineering company and then uh, eventually founded uh, my own company. Uh, Trying to do what you were trying to, <laughs> what you would like to have seen uh, back in the 80s, uh, a company called Speed Systems Incorporated, and uh, I ran that for 10 years. Uh, and then I became an independent consultant in uh, 91 and started publishing my newsletter, Speech Strategy News, in 93. And I just published my 224th monthly issue. So I've been doing this for a long time. Um, and uh, of course, I'm also holding a conference, the Mobile Voice Conference, and with Avios, the industry organization, uh, in March. So hopefully, that's a not too long an introduction. So uh, we got it. We did talk about it. you know certainly what's been thrust into mainstream here really is uh, the launch of uh, the iPhone 4S with uh, with Siri. I remember a couple of years ago, maybe 18 months ago, when when Apple bought Siri. Um, and it was just a standalone application in the App Store, and they bought it. And uh, 18 months later, they came out with a 4S, where Siri is an, uh, an integral part of, uh, of the operating system. But uh, is, is that what has kind of brought back or put the spotlight on this industry now? Yeah, I think um, the uh, you know speech recognition has been uh, had a lot of skeptics because there's been a lot of overpromising over the years. And of course, when you compare speech recognition to what we do as humans, even Siri is not quite there yet. So what Apple did is show that you could create a very useful personal assistant by doing that and by doing some things beyond speech recognition. So I think it's important that we realize that Siri is more than speech recognition. It includes natural language uh, uh, processing, which means it not only understands the speech in terms of being able to write it down, so to speak, as text, but interprets it. And then what the other thing Apple has done is very, which Apple's beautifully skilled at, is integrated very tightly with the rest of the features of the phone. For example, when you uh, uh, ask what's happening today, of course, it has to look at your calendar. So, you know, if it didn't have that information there to answer you, uh, it wouldn't seem like your personal assistant. So that there's really a number of levels there. Uh, the, the natural, the speech recognition itself has been, gotten very good over the years. Uh, I think uh, 
what people, uh, you know, the, the, the speech recognition uh, has gotten better and better uh, because the methodology has improved, but I think also because we have much more computing power and therefore the statistical models that are used in these speech recognition systems can, when they're being created, um, use a lot more computing power to create these models and you can then run them in real time without uh, somebody sitting there and waiting for five minutes for an answer. And I mean, I'm, I personally experienced this because when we were creating models in the 80s uh, on an $800,000 mini computer with its own air conditioning system and, ha and fire protection system, uh, if we actually literally had to run some app, some run for months and write software that if it crashed could restart. Uh, you know, so people don't realize that aspect of it. But even today, I'm sure that creating some of these models that Siri uses, it, for example, uh, took uh, takes many many hours of computer time. So um, you know, partly there's uh, the advance of computer technology, the advance of the technology itself, and the ability to use more data to create these models and therefore handle more variations in people's voices and accents. I think that's made the uh, really uh, gotten speech recognition to the point where it's what Malcolm Gladwell called the tipping point. And uh, Siri has demonstrated the utility of that. If you look at Apple's sales in the last quarter, which were so remarkable, you have to attribute uh, the huge uh, number of iPhones sold during that period to Siri since that was the major improvement between the iPhone 4 and the iPhone 4S. So we're certainly at a point where now everybody understands the technology is useful and you're hearing an awful lot going on now in many other areas as well as, uh, uh, as in uh, uh, mobile space. I'd like to get to another point, Bill, which is interesting, because it's not just the technology, it's also our acceptance of it, because the thing about Siri is that it's not just a personal assistant or an assistant, it is a smart assistant, and it's very human-like. I don't know if you've been watching out there in the blogosphere and in the internet, too, people have uh, pages dedicated to uh, Facebook and uh, pages dedicated to the jokes that Siri tells them. And, uh, right. you know, so it's a little bit of a cult. It's a little bit of a human thing. So keeping in mind that aspect of the technology, what is it that you see about the intelligence as, as we move forward? How might this um, have to evolve now that we accept and maybe even demand a Siri-like experience from other vendors? Yeah, you hit it right on the head, Peggy. The... Uh... You're, you're experiencing what I would call a personal assistant model. Uh, and Apple was very brilliant because they obviously had people that, uh, when I, I, I first uh, responded to it, I said that one of the things I thought that they might have done wrong was to increase expectations too high to where you feel it's intelligent. But then they put in all these answers to things like, what's the meaning of life? And, uh, you know, are you a man or a woman? And it, it's, it's interesting how they had to respond. It responds in a way that it's very clever and funny sometimes, but it always responds in a way that reminds you that it's your robot assistant. You know, I am not qualified to speak on that subject. You know, if you ask it something that's very human or some 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 humorous remark that actually is not an answer in many cases, but is humorous. So in a way, you get a response instead of it just saying "please repeat." <laughs> you know, they could have had it so I can't answer. You know, every time you said something, they said "please repeat." You know, which. Uh, Unfortunately, some systems, that badly designed systems do, um, but they made it something where it does give you a response. And I think, you know, this personal assistant model is really a paradigm shift. And I think it's more than speech recognition and natural language processing. Like I said, it also has to have a back end which can answer your questions. And so I'm not one, I, I feel, uh, I, I've always been very uncomfortable with the concept of artificial intelligence because we're not anywhere near being able to model a human. I mean, to be able, to, the truth of the matter is if you really wanted a, a computer to understand what it is to be a human, they'd have to have a human body and grow up and probably not do anything useful until they were 18 years old. And that's probably not too feasible. <laughs> the, the way we build humans now is uh, rather pleasurable and uh, I think we'll probably keep that same model. But we want robots to be robots, and uh, you know, and they can be friendly robots. And I think Apple has brilliantly de demonstrated that. And I think people have to be careful. You do see some people now talking about how they use artificial intelligence techniques. Today's artificial intelligence techniques um, are uh, really statistical. You need a lot of data, and what they really are is embedded intelligence in a sense. They 
take a lot of examples of what people would do in a certain situation and create a statistical model of that. And they understand nothing. They're not understanding something. They're modeling it. And I think uh, as long as we keep that in mind, uh, it can seem, these assistants can seem very personal. In fact, in a sense, we want computer intelligence because computers have access to much more information than we do. Uh, they're very good at uh, looking up very long lists of things like uh, song titles and so forth that none of us could commit to memory. So it's, it's actually more than uh, human intelligence. It's computer intelligence, and we should play to the strength of computers, which is their huge memory and, and ability to process a lot of information and do terrific searches. I mean, uh, you know, um, if uh, I was at, if somebody asked me how to, how to uh, you know, where is... Uh, Gelson's Market in Reseda, California, I, I, I would be able to give you the address, but Google would, right? So those, let's play the strengths of the computers and uh, not over worry whether it's a human intelligence. You know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting distinction there because what you're talking about is, is, uh, is functional intelligence. You know, what we see in, say, Ford Sync, recognizing that I want to play Pandora or go to a place, or what Siri does, which is I want to, you know, email my wife or text message my wife or change a calendar appointment. These are all very tactical based. There's no intuition, right? There's no gray area where Siri can, uh, uh, you know, interpret what it is that you're trying to say and, and add an emotional layer to it. So it's really, you know, we're in that task-based space, aren't we, with voice recognition today? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, you know, if you, when you do a Google search and it gives you seven websites, it's human intelligence that tells you which one you meant, right? So, I mean, there there's a level there where, you know, you can't get humans out of the loop, or if you did, of course, there'd be nobody to buy the iPhones, but... <laughs> What does that do? I mean, that's an interesting point, Rob, if you think about it, because it is that little bit of extra intelligence that means that from a business model perspective, from an, from an advertising perspective, and all the companies that, you know, make it their business to be high up in the search results or to impact those search results in some way, and Siri's just cutting right across and saying, you want to go here or you need this. What, what, what do you think about that as the disruptive business impact of, of, of voice now in a Siri, and a Siri-like uh, service? I think, uh, you know, um, you, you know you're, you're again bringing up a very good point because I think a lot of enterprises are going to realize they need a personal assistant, that people are going to expect that. When you call a call center, it should act like a personal assistant, and in fact, the technology exists for that and is being used by some companies. Uh, for example, uh, there are some companies where when you call in, the automated system will say, how can I help you? And then it'll give you some examples. People are not used to being, <laughs> not giving a list of menu items. So it'll say, for example, you can say, and so, you know, if you don't answer right away, but if you called in before, you know you can say, uh, I, I'd like my account balance or I need to talk to a representative, uh, you know, or, I know we've all, we, we think of humans as the ultimate thing, but I know we've all had the experience where you get connected to some agent, you talk to them for five minutes explaining your problem, they say, well, I can't handle that, I've got to transfer you to another department, and then you sit there on the line waiting a few minutes to get to the right agent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these systems actually use this uh, statistical method I talked about to decide pattern recognition technology if you want on top of the speech recognition, decide which agent they should route you to or which automated system they should route you to so you can get there directly. Uh, there's a lot of personalization that goes on too that makes this feel like a personal assistant. Some companies have it, some don't. You know, for example, if you call American Airlines, which is actually the phone I believe is answered by Microsoft's uh, system, because um, Microsoft, most people don't realize, has a very extensive uh, contact center hosting operation called Tell Me, which I think they're going to publicize in this coming month a little bit more, brand a little bit more. But when you call, if, if you've got a, play, a, a, a flight in the next, uh, and then identify yourself, uh, if you have a flight in the next uh, 24 hours, it'll say, give you your flight status. Without say, it'll say, by the way, your flight's on time or the flight was delayed or whatever before you even ask. So those kinds of personalization will make can make uh, dealing with a company seem like a uh, like a dealing with a person with the company's uh, the, the American Airlines personal assistant, if you want, or so forth. But I think they're going to also have to create such applications uh, for the mobile phone so that you can, in fact, 
on your mobile phone if you uh, say, uh, you know, I need to order some books from Amazon, the Amazon assistant will come on and have a little conversation with you. Uh, so that's going to be expected. I know I'm, you know, I predict, I tend to predict these things at a, uh, ahead of time, but, and, and there are some real organizational problems with doing that because call centers think of themselves as uh, doing one sort of function and the marketing people don't think of, of the uh, customer service as part of uh, marketing. If they just applied some of their advertising budget to creating some of these as personal assistants, which will be expensive to create, if they, so applied the advertising budget to that and took one less ad on in the Super Bowl, perhaps, uh, they'd get a lot more functionality throughout the year. Uh, I've, you know, I've said that before in blogs and so forth, and uh, I don't see anybody rushing to their wallets, but uh, I have a feeling that uh, if there's one or two examples of how well that works, like Apple approved uh, a voice assistant on a personal phone uh, works, I think we'll see that. I do want to say, though, we've talked so much about Apple here, there are other alternatives to, to Apple. Uh, the technology is not uh, unique to Apple. In fact, the speech recognition technology in Siri is provided by Nuance Communications, although Apple doesn't admit that and all Nuance is allowed to say is, yes, we've licensed some technology to Siri, uh, to, Nuance, uh, to Apple, rather. Uh, the, the speech recognition technology is nuanced and the natural language processing is uh, is in fact Siri. And it's in fact, Siri is a sort of a, uh, the name Siri comes from SRI International, SRII. You can see if you turn things around, you get Siri. And that, and it was a spinoff of SRI International, which used to be Stanford Research Institute and is up around that area. And they get a lot of government money. So in fact, uh, all of us have contributed uh, to the research that led to series <laughs> of our pocketbooks, uh, but the uh, there are there are other, Nuance has its own uh, uh, version, uh, Drag and Go, which is a downloadable personal assistant that will work, for example, on Android phones. Uh, Android phones themselves have um, built-in speech recognition for free, so any application developer can use the speech recognition provided by Google, which is network-based speech recognition and is very powerful. And that, But they have to add their own natural language interpretation layer, and that's the catch. Uh, but you've seen some people coming out with that, some key people that have, uh, the you mentioned EV earlier yep. today, uh, before we got on the air, so to speak. Um, they, it, they're they produced by a company that has a website that where you type in questions and get answers. So if you put a speech interface on that, all you need is uh, the speech recognition, and they've got the back end. Of course, they can only, they're not as flexible as Siri. They have no access to your calendar, for example. So a lot of these, uh, you'll see a lot of people saying they have uh, personal assistants, and they are personal assistants, but they don't necessarily integrate with your calendar and some other things. So there's still, it's still questions about what you mean. Google has a... But that's uh, the key. Let me just, let me just uh, interrupt there for a second. For Android. Bill? Bill, just for one yeah. second, because that's an interesting piece. Is I think that what happens here is that you've got um, the reason we talk about Siri so well is because it's so well integrated into the operating system. They, you know, obviously the, it's built in. And something like EV uh, by True Knowledge, you can download it, but it doesn't have that true feel, right? Because it doesn't integrate with calendaring and email that uh, that the native uh, oper well the native Siri does. And I think that that's one of the things that that. Um, uh, when you, when you start to you know look at the reasons why Siri is dominant, so, uh, dominating the conversation, it's because of the total integration in the operating system level. Yeah. Now there is another level. Nuance has um, um, a, uh, uh, a, a their drag and go. Yep. Instead of integrating with the operating system, it not integrates very well with websites. So it'll, for example, give you if you ask about a restaurant, it might give you movie reviews from Yelp, as, uh, excuse me, uh, restaurant reviews from Yelp as well as where the restaurant is. And it pulls on, it gives you, goes directly to the answer and it's t tied into Wolfram Alpha so you can yep. ask it, for example, who the president of Syria is or, or uh, questions such as that. So um, there's another, you can look uh, the question, what they're doing there is integrating with the web. And I think one reason that Google's so interested in this space is if you stop and think about it, they're bypassing search and going to the answer. Now, right. That's another model mm -hmm. which Siri does some of, but in fact, uh, companies like Nuance are probably uh, almost leading in this area, although they, of course, don't have the 
presence. They're starting to, they are, um, uh, there have been some phones like one from Tuning T Mobile where they were preloaded into the phone, but you're going to see uh, Google, Microsoft, uh, 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 Nuance, and I think Siri uh, do more of that web integration stuff too. So that's pretty significant because really, if you stop and think about it, if you bypass search and go directly to the answer, you can, uh, you're uh, stepping all over Google's model. And uh, Google's going to fight very hard, and so are a lot of other people going to fight very hard to control over the customer. And you know, stop and think about it. Uh, it, it the uh, Microsoft, of course, was launched when IBM said, uh, "We'll just let, um, we'll just let uh, uh, Microsoft." And what's important is the hardware. Well, we all know different now, right? So. People are aware that if they just let Google and Nuance and uh, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, and Apple uh, be the people in control of the customer, that Verizon Wireless and T-Mobile and those kinds of companies are going are losing a huge opportunity. And so there's going to be a fight over the customer, and the voice assistants are going to be a big part of it. And so we're talking about a lot of money here, guys. <laughs> I think it's very disruptive, and, and for that very reason is that, uh, you know, the base of a lot of this stuff, you know, search is definitely moving into a more localized, location-aware, contextualized environment on the mobile device, and uh, and people realize that, where there's more activity on mobile than there is in the web, and uh, there's more targeted activity in mobile than there is in the web, because um, the experience is different. So when, uh, an or when a software program like Siri or uh, a software program like EV or any of the other ones uh, start to leverage mobile and bypass the search engines, therefore bypassing display advertisements, uh, all of a sudden Google looks at it and they're very vulnerable when you talk about 85 to 95 percent of their revenue sitting in that display advertisement uh, uh, world. Y you really start to see why voice is all of a sudden a great way to bypass a monopoly in search. So. What, what, you know, from a mobile perspective, where does, how does this work? Because there are some natural places where this works, and then there are some unnatural places where this works. What are you seeing that works in the mobile space when it comes to uh, voice recognition and intelligence when it comes to voice recognition? Um, well, you, all you have to do is ask yourself um, the kinds of things you, you do uh, when you use your mobile phone, and when you use your mobile phone as a, uh, uh, as a, uh, for as a computer, in effect, as opposed to just making uh, communication. Of course, communication is important, and uh, your voice assistant can make a phone call for you or take text dictation and so forth, and that's important. But I think it's this conversation to get a result, especially for something that's always with you. Uh, you we're talking about a paradigm shift. Uh, you know, computers make us smarter because we can sit down and do a web search and find. Uh, I mean, you know, when Wikipedia went off the uh, air for one day. They warned students do your homework early. <laughs> you know, so the uh, uh, it's not you know these things are extensions of our human capability. And if you have to sit down on a computer to do them, it's not quite the same thing. But if you're carrying it in your pocket, it really almost becomes an extension of you. So this is extreme. This this is a very significant the reason. Everybody has. I think they've sold more mobile phones than there are people or something. I've heard statistics like that, uh, you know, and uh, you, you, you know, the computers in effect with the pad computers are a little bit more portable computers with a little bigger screen, but still, it's very inconvenient to type on them. I think we're going to want our person and off in cars because they have to have a hands-free option for safety. Uh, they all have a way to connect to your mobile phone while you're driving, uh, plus adding some other features. In terms of uh, controlling your phone or get listening to Pandora radio or other uh, things such as that, the car is now connected and, even, and sometimes connected to your mobile phone and allow you to deal with your personal assistant. Uh, th that model uh, is uh, uh, a fairly significant paradigm shift, and I think it's going to be uh, very important. Uh, uh, essentially, people will try to do anything they want to do by speaking. You're talking about the models and the possibilities, and beyond those, what I'm thinking is even further out to the connected home that's finally coming. You know, we saw CES with all the connected devices there, and we're seeing voice as an interface that 
um, can be part of that, but uh, more than even just sort of a, a remote control interface. It can actually bring intelligence into the home and move content around. I'm wondering if you can just explore for me the players you see in that space and also the capabilities that you see, the requirements for a company that wants to sit in the middle with uh, voice controlled, you know, voice at the, at the center of that experience. Yeah, I think, uh, again, we have to thank Apple for all the activity at CES on talking to your TV, for example, which I think is probably the most, the first place you'll, you'll see this take off. Uh, uh, because uh, Steve Jobs was quoted in Isaacson's biography as saying they, they had solved the TV problem, leaving it mysterious. But everybody's pretty much interpreted that as saying you'll be talking to your TV, your TV assistant, if you want, uh, with, a, with Siri, in effect. Uh, and of course, at CES, everybody tried to. Uh, Apple didn't wasn't even there, uh, but it has not announced an Apple TV. But everybody else basically did at mm -hmm. that show. Google had TV, and there were reports that Google's actually paying TV manufacturers to run their TVs on uh, on the Android and use uh, their speech recognition. Uh, Nuance has a TV option. Blingo does too. Blingo is being bought by Nuance, so that's going to. Uh, either give Nuance two options for TV or else they'll integrate the two. Uh, uh, Microsoft has announced uh, through its Xbox, um, for example, that when Xbox, uh, when you play the game, Xbox games attached to your TV, so they've added TV functions, and they're actually now licensing the Keep Connect peripheral, which allows voice control as a separate device that you can integrate to a TV set or integrate into a PC. Uh, so uh, what, what the model will be in your home, you'll sit there, and they also are using gesture control. I think that the, it's pretty hard with gesture control. You could select from a menu, but if you're going to have a voice assistant there, I think the voice assistant is going to be the dominant issue. Now, there are some issues that are different for mobile phones and TVs, when you have, but basically the idea is you'll be able to use your assistant to say, um, is, are, are there, uh, what, what, uh, what, movies are on HBO tonight, or questions like that, instead of searching all this huge content. Now, what it really means is that your TV is a PC. These are these new TVs, Samsung introduced some. So we're not talking about some futuristic. Samsung showed its TV, version of TV is essentially a PC. With uh, Intel has some chips made for TVs, which essentially make them into PCs, but now you have a different way of interacting. Well, voice will be a natural way of doing it. There are issues because you're talking at a distance, the TV is blasting, and you have to work around that, but there are technology ways of doing that. Uh, there are other issues, like uh, you have a microphone in your home, and uh, the speech is going over the internet to some, uh, some central server, uh, so essentially you've got a wiretap in your phone. There's going to be some privacy issues that people are going to worry about. When is it listening and when isn't it? I'm sure some TV show will say, oh, we can, we'll tap into the guy's home because he's got one of these TV things. You know sooner or later it's going to be an issue. But there are ways around that. You know, there are going to be some issues. I have to ask about that because, um, you know, it seems like a, an unnatural thing, I think, for most humans to talk to their television sets. Um, and, you, you know, uh, how do I maintain control over the remote control from my kids. You, you know what I'm saying is that th there's a whole lot of simplicity around um, not trying to change something just for the sake of change. Like, wow, wouldn't it be cool if we could get voice on our TV and I could do that. I could say, show me all the movies on Showtime. Um, but but at some point, you've got to sit back and think, you know, as, as complicated as that remote control is, and, and maybe as, as complicated as, as hand gestures are for the Kinect, for Microsoft Xbox Kinect, um, you, you know, there are certain places where voice won't fit shouldn't fit don't doesn't fit and uh and are, do you think that we're getting into that that craze right now because of what siri has done to apple um and the impact on business that we're trying to force fit voice into everything now where it shouldn't be fit yeah i think there's two aspects of that one first of all i have to say Congratulations if you've mastered your remote control. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say I have. My kids have, my, but I want to own it. We have the home entertainment set up you know, that my son helped me put together, uh, and every now and then I have to spend a half an hour figuring out how to 
turn the TV back on after I listen to a CD or something. Uh, so, I mean, you know, and, and you, I, I don't know if you, you're like me, but I, we have free remote control sitting on the, uh, the coffee table in the, in the living room. Uh, it, you know, so integrating that, just solving that problem, uh, I think there's motivation for being able to uh, have sort of those things uh, tied together so you can record, you know, instead of dealing with a, your DV, the digital video recorder separately, you can just say record and it knows that that's a, instructions to the digital video recorder. Now, Apple will probably be one of the first to put all those pieces together because that's their talent. And I think right now we're seeing people not necessarily putting all the pieces together, but that's going to be a key. The, the other part of your question, though, is there is obviously places where voice is, is not suitable. Even with mobile phones, of course, you can't, uh, when you can't talk sometimes because it's too noisy or it would be impolite or uh, what you're saying is private. Uh, I think we're, there the personal assistant model still works if you were allowed to type what you would say. It still might be easier than navigating to some application, finding the right menu, finding the right selection on the menu, then typing something into a box. Anyway, why not just type what you want and let the natural language processing part of it get you directly to the answer? So still the part that does natural language processing and does the direct to content or whatever you want to call it model that gets you the answer instead of a list of websites or a list of alternate things you have to search further. Uh, those two things are still very powerful. So if your model was, I'm going to type to my assistant if I can't talk to them, then it works in a lot more environments. And maybe your remote control will be a little keyboard that you type to if, if you don't feel like talking. Uh, uh, of course, a little keyboard is, a, is, is part of the problem with mobile phones, of course. So we, you know, that's where speech would, would come in. Uh, if, you know, again, if you make... Uh, you know, I, I thought of, for example, uh, if uh, there are certain certain products that where the personal assistant could have a real personality and you'd actually enjoy talking to them. You know, I've, I've often, you know, thought that maybe Budweiser could create the Bud guy and give you advice on your sex life and do anything that you know the beer advertisement kind of stuff would do. Uh, and you know, and you can think of uh, a, a lot of things where you know maybe the uh, one of these. Uh, insurance company that has a little uh, mascot that's an animal, would you, your personal assistant would be talking in that, uh, that assistant's uh, voice. So, you know, uh, there's lots of room for everything. Keeping that in mind, and we were talking about, you know, the connected experience, and you said, well, Apple has pretty much, pretty much got it together going out of the gates, but I'd still like to hear from you a little bit. I wouldn't say a SWOT analysis, but I would like to hear from you about the companies that you see um, you know, covering most of the bases or with the capabilities that they're going to need to really sort of tie this up going forward and maybe also some newcomers that are going to fit into some interesting niches, maybe the ones that are going to power that, uh, that mascot or that, uh, that bud guy. <laughs> right. Um, well, there are a, a number of people who have uh, spent uh, many years figuring out how to make better voice user interfaces, usually for contact centers. So sometimes they've had real constraints in terms of what they're told they can do by the managers uh, in terms of what they want to spend, because it can be quite expensive to do a natural language interface. But we're the uh, in terms of technology, I think we have to look at the companies that have made huge investments in technology and have huge uh, capabilities to process speech in the network. And of course, the most obvious ones are Apple, Google, and Microsoft, but Nuance Communications uh, is one of those companies that has bought a lot of other companies with core technologies. They have something like 3,000 patents. They have sued smaller companies, but they've never gone after an Apple or a Microsoft or a Google. And in fact, Apple's using their technology right now. So, uh, you know, it's, it, that's a company that I wouldn't uh, ignore in terms of what and they are already doing it with. They do have a personal assistant, which I said, um, which will, uh, they have a TV offering. For, if you want to look at a small company with really great core technology, you have to look at Nuance. Um, and of course, Microsoft and Google have put a lot of money into speech, researching speech technology and natural language technology over the years. Uh, there are a number of smaller companies that are involved in this as well that have either a piece of the technology. There's uh, 
companies that have little specialized things, a company called Sensory Incorporated that has a, what they call a truly hands-free technology, which essentially until you say a keyword, it isn't listening. So it doesn't go off and do something strange. Now that's probably a great thing with TV, as I've argued, that may be really important to say, have, you know, high TV or something like that to wake up the TV so you know it's not listening until you ask it to. So those kinds of things, there's spe a lot of there's specialized company, there's some specialized stuff that's going on. Nuance Communications I mentioned because if you look at the number of companies they bought over the years, they bought a lot of companies with very with core technology. Lingo was a, a competitor in the personal assistant space. They they uh, and they fought with patent battles and some pretty other uh, legal things that got kind of nasty before they agreed. Lingo agreed to be acquired. I presume at a higher price after the battle. But the uh, uh, it you know there's uh, there there aren't a huge number of people in in the space and there are people uh, like Apple which really didn't have a core speech technology uh, for a while. Steve Jobs uh, it's reported to me by some people that worked in speech at Apple was not an enthusiast for speech for many years so they did not put the same kind of core in, of uh, investment in the core technology as other people which is why. They're using Nuance now, and they've got some licensing deal with Nuance, which I don't know what it is, but it is some deal. Um, and uh, uh, you know, there aren't a huge number of players I've talked about are uh, pretty powerful in in different ways, and we're going to see some interesting battles. So the uh, Japanese companies, I think, are doing some work in speech technology too, but uh, that hasn't been as apparent. Well, I think that it's it's um you, you know whatever's happening here. I, I read um, a lot about uh, Microsoft's investment into uh, into speech recognition and Bill Gates' view of, of speech recognition when he was running Microsoft, and and um, certainly we're starting to see that come to fruition. It just shows you how long it takes for uh, an acceptable level. You know whether it's uh, the processing uh, power on a mobile device to be able to get to that point where it's a seamless interaction voice to computer we're still we're still at that very early stage bill where can people find out about you where can they follow you uh well my website is uh, for, for tma associates which is the uh kind of the banner i go under is tmaa.com uh, and uh, there they can get sample issues of my newsletter or some articles i've written i also have a blog now called my Zell on mobile uh which is MyZellOnMobile.com with hyphens between the uh, MyZell on and mobile. Um, uh, so, the, and there I've uh, expressed some of the opinions you've heard here, maybe elaborated on a few of them. So, if uh, people are interested, that's a free blog, of course. Uh, they can just take a look at that. That's great, Bill. Look, I can't thank you enough for coming on and and talking about this. I think it's a, you know, certainly um, uh, a technology whose time is coming. Um, and it's uh, it's been in the making for such a long time. It's certainly topical, and we really appreciate you you know providing some insight into uh, into what's going on in voice, what's going on in voice and mobile. Thank you, Bill. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed talking to you. Thank you, Bill. And that is Bill Mizell. So he, as I said at the beginning, we we plugged it all the way through. He's got a, a conference, a mobile voice conference in San Francisco on March twelfth to fourteenth. I think just go to mobilevoiceconference.com. You can find out much more about it. So that's the end of that, our segment. Um, I want to uh, I want to draw attention to uh, a company in this, our segment, which we're calling the Goblet of Rock. I, I've got it right here. That was very timely for my phone to go off like that, but the Goblet of Rock. In honor, actually, of Bruce Springsteen playing the Grammys this Sunday, if you're writing <laughs> down. Um my gob it's my turn to do this, and my goblet of rock is it's a little bit self-serving because it's an Ottawa-based company, uh, and it has something to do with mobile, but it's much more uh, akin to what we were talking about with Kevin Toffel a, a number of weeks back around wearable computing and uh, the trend that we're seeing right now. It's somewhat jewelry-based, and eventually it's going to get into you know heart rate monitors and and algorithms and body weight and temperature and 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 uh, insulin levels and sugar levels and all that. But before we get there, it's about jewelry. There's an Ottawa company that um, I'm very familiar with. It's a company called Dexter, and it's at Dexter.ca. Um, the Dexter is a handcrafted watch chassis for the iPod Nano. We've seen a lot of these, and what makes this one so unique? The approach. 
first of all, they've done old school. Uh, you know, the chassis pops up like a like an old tape deck, which is the coolest thing in the world. Just pops up in, like an old eject <laughs> tape deck. For those of you who are listening who don't know what a tape deck is, well, go, to, go Google talk it. To, go talk to your parents. <laughs> and you're so lucky uh, that you're so young. The um, but w- what I love about it is that uh, it's sourced locally. All of the all of the stuff that they've built it with. So th- they built uh, all the materials are uh, are within basically driving distance to the city. So uh, the leather bands are done in Montreal. The chassis is built in like you know Windsor or something like that. It is localized. It's built in North America. They really wanted to make sure that they could have the high quality product. And and that's what I love about it. It's attention to detail. In a fast food world. You know, where everything is on demand and easy to use, they, they took a slow approach to build this product. And now they're actually about to get distribution uh, deals across the country, which I am so excited for them. So I, I implore you, go to Dexter dot, Dexter.ca to take a look and see how a fine crafted product actually can come together like this. Um, I, I, uh, I, I, so I raise my goblet to Dom and his wife for putting this two person team. They handcraft them themselves. The Dexter, Dexter.ca. That's, that's a great one, around. Rob. I mean, that that's a that's a great story. Well, it is Hand a crafting uh, in the digital age. That's that's exactly the way things have to go. It's like people talking about handwritten notes when everyone's doing email. Yeah, this has potential. I like this. When's it coming to Europe? I, it's a good question. I mean, they take orders worldwide, so they'll ship everywhere. So don't be right. don't be afraid. Go go and buy, buy Canadian, ship local. Uh, it, it, it's a it's a wonderful story, and, and we're we're very uh, I'm so enthusiastic to have these guys uh, in the city and in Canada. So Dexter that's my goblet of rock. And everybody had better watch Springsteen on the uh, on the Grammys. That's it. Before we go, we are going to continue on the voice path. Next week's show. Uh, this is actually a, 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 it's going to be a very interesting show. We we have um, the director of the International Computer Science Institute at Berkeley. His name is Roberto Piracini. He'll probably correct me a thousand times next week. But R- Roberto uh, Piracini, who is uh, uh, also uh, an author uh, of the book The Voice in the Machine, and it's a book on the history of computers that understand speech. Uh, it's done by MIT Press. It's coming out in 2012. He's been in voice since 1981, so this guy is knows what he's talking about. As I said, he's a director of the ICSI at at Berkeley University. Can't wait to have this guy on to uh, to to have Roberto on to talk about um, you know the path that he's taken and the outcomes and where we're going in this in this uh, in this voice because it's, it might not just be the year of the year. Um, this is something that these guys have probably been waiting for. For 30 years, at least Roberto has, and maybe this is, uh, I can't wait to get his perspective on this. Well, we're at the tipping point, so to have a guest like that will not just be informative, entertaining, and I'll just be soaking it up, but it is actually indicative, telling us how this is going to play out. I think that's extremely important at this point. Well, I, we can't wait. We're looking forward to that, and uh, so we'll bring that to you next Friday, a week from the time you're watching this right now. Just come back, listen to Roberto, talk about these things that are so important. Timely, topical. That's what we do here on Impulse. Peggy, that's it for episode number five. As I said, we'll be here next week for episode number six. Bring more in-depth analysis. We're going to look at the back of the envelope, not what everybody else is talking about, and Roberto will be here to talk about voice. Until then, we'll see you next time from Canada. A. A. (laughs) 